Welcome to the Top Line Power Breakfast Club. Um, this is a breakfast uh, seminar series that we run uh, typically about four times a year. Uh, and uh, normally we do it live in, in uh, Stockholm uh, on site. And now for obvious reasons we, we do it as a live webinar instead. Today we will talk about monetizing software and digital innovations in the times of COVID-19. <clears throat> and we're seeing that many customers of ours, many companies, are hit hard by the current ongoing crisis. But we also see that, that the changing business and consumer behaviors are creating new opportunities for companies. And, and one of those opportunities is that it's a good time to, to boost the, the, the top line and, and to, to grow our, our software and our digital service businesses. And, and some of those changes in behavior we're seeing are temporary, while others will also be permanent. So for those who act now, uh, they also have the, the chance to be very well positioned uh, as we go out of this crisis. So my name is Tommy Arvenel. I'm, I'm uh, Senior Director uh, at Simon Kocher & Partners. I'm, I'm based out of our, our Stockholm office. Um, and uh, to, to, to make it very short, I've, I've been working with commercial strategy and, and, and uh, pricing related issues for closer to 20 years right now. So, uh, and, and focusing mostly on, on uh, uh, B2B related industries, uh, including software and, and manufacturing industries. So, <clears throat> um, we, we see that this um, uh, crisis is, is creating a, a number of symptoms uh, for, for companies in, in terms of commercial symptoms. Firstly, we're experiencing uh, supply issues and operational issues. So, some suppliers cannot meet our requirements and we're having uh, trouble visiting and, and servicing customers uh, uh, on site. And we see a significant reduction in our physical purchasing channels. Secondly, we're also seeing a rapidly change in demand profiles. Obviously, many companies are experiencing very big demand reductions, but some are also experiencing major mix changes, meaning that their customers stop buying some products and, and buy more of other products instead, uh, and, and not, not just affecting the top line, but also creating challenges operationally and, and in the commercial organization to, to meet that uh, changed demand. Uh, we're also seeing both with consumers and businesses an increased risk aversion. Uh, companies are, are building their inventory to mitigate those supply issues. Uh, and, and of course, in a crisis, every CFO knows that you need to preserve your cash. And, and, and that's what we're seeing, that, that, that customers and companies are reluctant to take on upfront investments and upfront uh, cost in, in, in these times. We also see a very big push of digitalization. Uh, obviously, when we cannot visit our customers with our physical sales force, the, the customers instead need to procure our services through other uh, often digital channels. Uh, we see a rapid adoption of, of digital tools, uh, both internally and also externally facing customers to meet that, that, that changing b behavior. Um, <clears throat> this is a live broadcast, broadcast webinar, so, so, uh, and, and, and we're on YouTube, but if you look at the, uh, below the, the YouTube window, you will find that there is a question field there. So feel free, please, to ask your questions as we go on during the webinar. I think there is a slight delay. Uh, so if you, uh, as soon as they, they pop up in your mind, you just write them in, in, the, in the question field, 
and, and we'll answer them all at the end of the, uh, of the session. Uh, <clears throat> we recently did a survey among our clients uh, to understand how the ongoing crisis is affecting them. And, and of course, what we saw is that many are facing a reduction of revenue, a reduction of sales. Uh, but but the, the picture is very diverse. Uh, also, a significant share of our, our clientele us that no, we're not very much affected at all. And some experience actually significant increases in sales. Uh, we're also seeing that uh, customers or, or the clients of our customers buy different products. So th there is a mixed change, uh, not necessarily a, a change in the, in the total revenue, but customers are buying different products, buying different services than, than they used to before the crisis. And, and obviously an example is that uh, restaurants are closed, but people or, or many restaurants are closed, but, but people still need to eat, right? So they, they buy their food in stores instead. So in the, in the food sector, that is a huge mix change towards their B2B channels, uh, from their B2B channels to, to, towards in, instead their, their retail channels, right? Um, we had another uh, webinar about COVID-19 response strategy, and, and this is the summary of our 11-point uh, checklist uh, as a response to, to, to the ongoing crisis. I just want to highlight three of those, um, three of those uh, uh, insights because they're, they're very much relevant to what we're going to talk about today. Um, the first one is that oh, th this crisis is really hitting companies very differently, as we saw in our survey, right? So uh, uh, it's very important that we reassess our market. We, we assess in our customer base, both current and potential, how is the crisis impacting? And it's also different in, in the long term versus the short term. For example, we see that, that the, the aviation industry is obviously very severely affected and, and we expect that that, that, you know, that that will be so for a while. It will take time for them to come back. Uh, while, for example, other industries uh, uh, like uh, uh, consumer electronics, in-store retail will, will it's also affected because people cannot visit the stores, but we expect them to recover much more quickly as soon as the, the, the limitations of mobility are, are, are lifted. Right? Secondly, companies are, are being hit hard financially by the crisis, which means that, that the, the number of customers that are price sensitive that, that we usually see is likely to increase. So, so we're going to see a bigger segment of price sensitive customers. So how can we react to that? We, we can just lower our prices. That's one solution. But the problem is that if we do that, we have sold the product and we cannot sell it again at a, at a higher price. So, so what we recommend is that you create what we call a least expensive alternative, which means that you take your current product, you strip it down to it's bare bones, so this still meets the basic needs of the customers uh, so that you can have a product, an offering to land customers and keep customers in this current crisis, but then that you also have taken out things that you then have still left in your standard products, and you, meaning that, that you then have something left to upsell the customers after this crisis so is over, after the financial situation stabilizes and customers are more, more willing to invest again. And be very careful to, when you do this, create or, and define clear upsell paths so that you have a plan for when you sell this, uh, uh, this fighter product or the least expensive alternative product, that you have a plan for how do we then, when we land the customers on that product, take the customers up to and upsell them to our standard offerings again. 
And thirdly, uh, companies are ke keeping their cash, they're holding on to their cash, um, meaning that, that this is a very good opportunity to consider a subscription model for your offerings. And, and of course, uh, another benefit of a sub subscription model is, is that it, it, it reduces the upfront front, front for the customers, but it also provides you with a more stable cash flow. And, and, and stable cash flow is something that drives company valuation. And I think this, this chart illustrates it very well that Storytel, uh, which is an audiobook company, now it's a consumer business, but the same applies to, to B2B, right? It's an, it's an audiobook company with a subscription model versus Volati, which is an audiobook company and bookstore company with a transactional business model. And, and the transactional business model is much more vulnerable because you need to sell again and again to generate that revenue that you, that you have forecasted. While in the subscription model, you, you have the customers on an ongoing basis. Uh, for those of you who don't know Simon Kocher, uh, uh, short introduction. So, so <clears throat> we are a, a global strategy consultancy. We have uh, 39 offices in, in 25 countries, I think close to 1,500 associates by now. And what really differentiates us is that we are focused on commercial strategy and, and we don't do operations, we don't do HR, we don't do financial uh, consulting, we focus only on the commercial agenda. And, and we do so across a number of industries. This is a, a, a few examples from the manufacturing sector with companies like ABB, Bosch, uh, etc. Uh, and also relevant for this presentation is that we also work a lot with the software and IT industries uh, across the world with companies like Cisco and, and LinkedIn, for example, uh, that we help address their commercial uh, issues and, and their, their commercial strategies. Uh, so w when we work with software companies, one of the first things, and, and of course also industrial corporations with, with software businesses, uh, one of the first things that, 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 that we see is typically something l like this. This is a very common picture, that, that, that you ask your customers, you know, what are your needs, what are your preferences, how, how important are different aspects of our offering to you as a customer? And not, not, not to, uh, and, and, and often you see a picture like this, that, that the price often comes up fairly high, right? So like in this case, 21% of, of customers say, say that price is, is uh, very important to us. And, the, and you, can, you can draw a conclusion from this picture that, yeah, of course, then, then we should address the price. We need to compete on price. That, that's a key success in this market. But if you take it one step further and you dig into the data and you do, this is simply a cl cluster exercise. You, you see what are the patterns in, in this data among, among, the, among the customers. You will see something like we did in this product example that, that in fact there are not one, there's not one homogeneous mass of customers. There are four very distinct segment, segments. One segment wants the best. So you see that, that in, in, in their case, the product performance is clearly what they value the most. Another segment, and that's actually the largest one, they're very concerned with on-time delivery, they're concerned with the speed of delivery. And this is most likely an industry that is a just-in-time industry, like for example in, in, in automotive. And, and then finally, 20% only, they, they are very much focused on price. Uh, and, and this is very important because, and, and the reason I'm starting with it is that, that Everything that we do and that, that I will be talking 
about from here on is really building on this outside-in perspective. And it's a differentiated picture where we recognize that there are very different customers out there in the market and they have different needs. They have different ways of procuring our, uh, our services and products. And uh, that means that we need to adapt our offerings. We need to adapt how we set prices, how we charge, as well as how we serve and how we sell to those customers. So a lot about what we do is really about understanding this diverse picture of customers and aligning the way we offer, the way we price, the way we go to market with how customers are behaving and what their preferences are. So I'll be covering four areas and these are really the four keys to successfully monetizing B2B software. Firstly, it's really about what you sell. What is it that we place in front of the customer that, that he buys from us? And one very important aspect is of that is, is how do we, in our offer structure, define clear cross and upsell paths? Uh, in particular, in, in the software industry, that is very much uh, a key success factor to monetizing the value uh, that you bring to your customers. Secondly, how you charge. It's not about how much you charge, but the way you charge your customers. Uh, and, and there are two aspects to that. One is, is the price metric. I'll, I'll go deeper into this later on. It's the price metric, that is the metric that, that drives how much you charge. Like for example, you charge per user, you, you charge per, uh, per uh, number of uh, uh, units processed or, or whatever you're using in, in your particular product. And the second part is how, that, how the price scales as the metric increases. So is it, is it a... Uh, um, uh, one-time fee where, where you have unlimited volume or do you have a uh, uh, per-usage-based per model um, uh, th th that drives your price. And the second area is, of course, how much you charge, what, what you charge. And, and in particular in the software industry, I would say that we very often see a very big difference in, in willingness to pay. It's a large span between the lowest willingness to pay customer to the highest willingness to pay customers. And, and of course, to, to address that, to meet that different um, uh, needs for, for different prices, we also have to work with not only the price, but also with, with the offer structure uh, and the price model. And then finally, of course, the setting the, the, the price level. Uh, the final area, and, and I think which is particularly interesting now in, in these times of COVID-19, is how we sell, how we go to market. So starting with the, the, the offer model, with how we sell. Th this is a project that, that we did um, for a subscription business. So on the left-hand side, you see that they, they had three offerings, Elite, Deluxe, and Plus. And what we really did, uh, very simply, is that we added a new premium offering at a significant higher price than what they had before. And we also raised the prices of the current offerings. And, and this may seem like a small change. We didn't do much changes to, to the products uh, uh, themselves. We just added a new product to the portfolio and adjusted the prices. This had a significant effect on, as you see on the lower right-hand side, on both the monthly recurring revenue uh, uh, from, from, from new subscribers as a total and, and also the, the average from, from the incoming new sus subscribers. Both those numbers increased significantly, 88%. Uh, and 62% respectively. And uh, this only by, by adding the new premium product 
And what really happened is that this new premium offering worked as an anchor. It, it showed that, that the other offerings are not that expensive, really, if you compare to the premium one. Um, and and um, it's a simple technique that, that doesn't cost much money to implement and has a huge impact on your profitability. And this is why the offer structure is very important to get right. Uh, <clears throat> the first question you need to ask yourself is, uh, what, what, is our, what is our bundling strategy? So, so on the one extreme, you can have an all-you-can-eat model. And, and this we often see in, in new products and new companies that are, are launching an, an, a new service. Because it's very simple. It's easy to understand. It's easy to explain to customers. But the problem is, of course, that, that, that you sell everything to everyone, uh, uh, sa same thing to everyone, and everything is included. So once you sold your product, there is nothing left to sell. You, you cannot upsell. And given that we see this very big span in willingness to pay in the software market, this really limits your ability to extract the value you're creating for, for your customers. On the other extreme, you have, you can call it an a la carte model, but which means that customers can pretty much pick all the modules that they want uh, and make their own uh, solution. And, and that is, of course, very flexible, uh, but it's also complex. It's complex for your customers to understand what are our options. It's complex for your sales organization to explain to your customers. And what we're seeing often in practice is a combination. So uh, you often see functional packages, like, for example, here's the package for the finance department, here's the, the software package for the HR department, and... and uh, <coughs> Uh, and often uh, in combination with the functional packages, for example, you, you see good, better, best. So here's the HR software, the, the good solution, the better solution, and the best solution. And, and configuring this structure and getting this structure right is very much the key to be able to address the different needs of your customers, both in terms of having the right balance between what functionality do I have in, in my software and, and, uh, uh, and, and not making the, the, the product too complex, but also balancing the, the, uh, the value that the client is getting from your software versus the, the, uh, the fee he's paying for it. Right? And, and what's really important here is to be careful to define your upsell paths. Because software is a, a product that, that typically is hard for customers to understand. It's hard to sell the value of a software solution before your customers have tested it. So when we ask customers of software companies uh, uh, before they become customers versus after they have tested and learned how to use the software, their willingness to pay is typically much higher when they have adopted and learned what value they can get out of your software. So therefore, those upsell paths are very critical so that when they have realized and, and proven the value of your solution, you can then upsell them to more premium solutions. Um, the, the key to an effective bundling strategy and, and bundling structure is really to understand feature by feature of your offering. It's not only technical each feature, so it's also your service levels. Um, to understand what is it that customers value in our offering, and, and be careful here because we always see a difference between the internal view and what customers think. I, I think we, we, we tend to sometimes become too excited by our technology and, and we forget to look from the outside and in on our products. So, so getting this customer view is, as input is really important to, to get the offer structure aligned with what customers value and, and what they do not value. And what we want to achieve, and, and of course you have seen uh, 
structures like this many times. What we want to achieve are a list of features that, that resonates with customers, that, that triggers what they actually value in your offering in terms of both technical features, in terms of your, uh, your service features. And then we want to highlight, because some of those features are going to be more valued than others. <clears throat> some of them are going, to be on, are going to be valued by all customers. Others are going to be uh, not valued by uh, most, but then very highly valued by a few. And by understanding that, we can highlight the, the, the features that, that are really key, that pulls and drives the customers into the different packages that we place in, in front of the customers. And we want to make sure that, as you see here, we have a significant value change. And of course, the, the three example packages you see here also have different price tags. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have a significant value difference between these packages so that there are strong arguments to upsell, in this case, customers from a basic to a professional package. And this is really a, a you know, quite structured process. The, the, the first step, as, as we discussed, is to identify how do customers value the features uh, of your offering. Uh, we, we place those features in, in different roles. We call them leaders, fillers, and killers. I'm not going into the details. But that kind of gives us the, the building blocks to work with. And then there is also a creative aspect here. So typically then we work with different scenarios in terms of how you can build up your office structure. We test how does it fit with the needs and, and preferences of different segments. How does it facilitate an effective upsell pass to take customers from the lower end offerings to the premium ones where we can monetize our, our value creation. Secondly, is how you charge. So it's not about how much we charge, but what we charge for and, and what drives that price. And there's a lot of psychology in this. So <clears throat> this is an example from, uh, from an online uh, platform, I believe is for, for the sale of, of automobiles, uh, of cars. And as you see, to, to put it very simple, as you see on the left-hand side, we really changed, without changing the total price, we changed from fee one to fee two. So we increased the share of the green fee or the green uh, part of the price, <clears throat> and we reduced the share of the red one. Uh, with very little effect on, on the total price for the customers. And if you look at, on the right-hand side of the chart, <clears throat> you can see after the red line on the timeline, you see the dramatic effect this had on volume. And what drives this is really customer psychology, because uh, in this case, customers were looking much more keenly on fee number one than on fee number two. So we simply reduced fee number one and increased fee number two. And that had a dramatic effect on the volume uh, on, on this uh, online platform. Uh, <clears throat> when, when, we, um, when we define a, a price model, so there, there, there are two aspects of a price model. One is the price metric. Uh, those are what we saw on the previous slide. That they, you call them fees as well. But, but th these are really the, the, the metrics that, that drives the price that, that we're charging for. And then the second part is, is how that metric scales with, with usage, with volume. Uh, we really see three types of price metrics. The, the, the first one is, is uh, uh, simply the service input. For example, how many users do you have? of your software product. How many branches does your customer have? So we charge a, a fee per branch. 
the second type is outputs. Uh, that could be, for example, we, we work with a, a, a software that provides um, a, a software company that provides software for uh, financial departments to process invoices. So one of their metrics was number of invoices, and, and th that's an output metric. Uh, the more invoices we process in our software, the more you pay us. The third part is the, the business outcome. And, and that, that is really reflecting or most closely reflect, reflecting the value uh, your customers are getting out of your solutions. So uh, it could be, for example, cost savings. Uh, if you uh, have an effect on the market share, you could try to measure the market share uplift, etc. These are typically uh, complex to, to measure. We often, when we uh, define uh, price metrics, we often have them on our long lists. But as we test what actually works in practice, we often conclude that you know, they, 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 are, they are hard to measure because you, you need to be able to measure you don't want to end up in discussion with your customers about how much should you actually pay. So it, it needs to be transparent and you need to be able to measure the, the, whatever metric that, that you go for. The, the second, second part is, is how does the price scale with the metric? And, and here you have a number of, of different ways. So everything from a flat rate, it doesn't scale at all, to pay as you go. Uh, for example, you, you, you pay $100 per user uh, for the first user and for the 100th user. Uh, another model is, is that, uh, that you, you pay, um, you have first have a package, and after that you have a, a, a pay-per-use, so meaning that, that for the, uh, for you first buy five users at $500, and for the six users you pay an, an additional $100, so a total of 600 and after that you have a linear model. And the, the, this, the structure you, you go for is really key to address the, uh, the uh, because this affects price differentiation. And, and one aspect is here to consider how does this structure we pick affect the small customers versus the large customers so that we get the right balance in, in, the, in the price between the, the different size segments uh, of our customers. And what we typically do is that we, we have a long list of candidates. We evaluate them from two perspectives. How well do they work for our clients versus how well do they work for our business? And from the client perspective, my experience is really that, that if you can, if, if clients tell you that, that yes, it makes sense, this metric when that increases, then my value that I'm getting from your software, then that also increases. If they tell you that, then the metric will work in practice because then, then you can argue for why customers should pay more as the metric increases. The third part is how much you charge. And this is, of course, when, when you talk about pricing, this is what people think first about. Uh, <clears throat> we, um, th this is from a, a product example where some customers of this client of ours had been presented with a price, some customers had not. And, and we went out and interviewed customers to understand how much they were, willingness, were willing to pay for, for our client solution. So they, they, they were just in the launch phase of this new product. Some had seen prices, others had not. And, and what we saw that is, is that the, the customers who had seen, um, not necessarily been, been quoted, but they had seen a lower price, also had much lower willingness to pay. So the first price you show and that you mentioned to a customer really colors and really affects the willingness to pay that that customer will have for your solution. Which means that, that, that it's really important to get that first price that we put in the market right. We need to make it fact-based. And what we typically do 
is that we use multiple methods. We discuss with, with uh, your internal experts, so your product managers, and, and your sales organization that talks to customer, customers. Sometimes we do a, a TCO analysis or, or a value and use analysis to understand rationally if we do a business case, how much money is your customers saving from using your solution, or how much more generating uh, revenue do, do they generate using your, your solution. We typically check market benchmarks as far as they're available and, and we use our, our survey techniques to survey customers uh, to get direct input on, on uh, customers' willingness to pay. And uh, as discussed before, you will see a big difference between different customers and different segments. So the, the key is really here, how many prices can we place in the market? How much do we need to differentiate? And that's the balance between complexity and the value of that price differentiation. The final area or the final uh, key is how we sell our software. How do we take it to market? And in, in, in these uh, dynamic times of, of COVID-19, what we are seeing uh, already before um, B2B web commerce was on a you know, pretty steep growth tra trajectory. So 9% CAGR, this is according to Forrester Research, uh, and, and it's, for, it's data for the top five EU countries. And it's only web commerce, it's not including EDI, which in our mind is not really um, uh, uh, digitalization. Um, and what we are seeing and, and, and what customers tell us is that the ongoing pandemic and the COVID-19 crisis is really accelerating the, uh, the digital channels. So uh, what, we, what was important before in, in serving and utilizing these channels efficiently and effectively is even more important now because we are convinced that, that uh, COVID-19 has a temporary effect that will disappear. But some of the changing behaviors, and I think this is certainly one example of such a behavior, the shift towards web channels is going to be permanent. When we sell on the web, we can actually learn from our kids and, 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 and from the makers of the toys that our kids use. This is a, 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 an illustration of something called uh, Panini card. So, so <coughs> it, it comes, uh, it, it's named after the inventor of, of these football cards that, that, that your kids can collect. So my, my, my daughter, for example, she, she connect, collects uh, Pokemon cards and, and she wants the, the full set of all Pokemons. Uh, and, and if she's missing a Pokemon, then, then she, she, ta she, she ke keeps talking and reminding her parents about the, the, that she wants that last missing Pokemon. And what, what this effect does, it's really highlighting that that uh, uh, what is missing? There is a missing Pokemon here. I want to complete. It. I want to have the full set. Same with the with the soccer team and the soccer cards, right? So you want the full team, and the cards the, for 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 that full team. And and this is called the Panini effect. You're showing customers a set of products uh, that is incomplete, and that the customer has an inherent drive to want to complete. Uh, and of course, this is implemented in in, uh, in the consumer business, but it also works in B two B. Consumers are irrational, but business buyers are only slightly less irrational. Uh, and and this is an example from uh, a manufacturing company, where we set up different aspects of their offering. We made it into puzzle and then we, we, we made a very illustrative graphic illustration of what is it that you have now in place? What have you bought from us? And what, what is it that we think you need and have not bought from us? What's key here, of course, is that the, 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 
the offers, the, the, the complete puzzle that you place in front of the customers, that all the pieces in that puzzle are actually relevant. Otherwise, it loses its effect because then the customer realizes, well, that's, I don't have that, but that's not relevant for me, so therefore uh, I, I stop looking at it. So all the pieces need to be relevant for the customers that you present it to. Another effect, um, so looking at the, the, the example offer structure we, we, we looked at before, another effect that, that has uh, a significant impact is, is uh, if you see the anchor symbol, and this is called the, the anchoring effect. Um, so by, by placing a very premium offering in front of the customers that has also obviously a, a, a higher price, even if this is an offering that you don't expect many customers to want to buy, this has what's called an anchoring effect. So it makes the other offers you're presenting to the customers look less expensive and more attractive. And if you combine that with, like we have illustrated here, a recommended sticker or, or a, a most purchased sticker or, or something like that, you, you often see it on, on, on consumer websites, right? Um, the, these, these are powerful, the, the, these two effects use powerful psychological effects and, and, and nudges your customers towards the solution and, and the version that you actually want them to buy. Another aspect of the online sales process, and, and this, of course, existed all, all already before the COVID-19 crisis, is that we don't meet the customer uh, until much, much later. And, and now, of course, now in the, during the crisis, not at all, but after the crisis, um, uh, only late in the purchasing process. So typically, customers, they, they assess their needs. They, they may engage some consultant to help them do that. They, they uh, determine their target costs, they, they select the long list and they pre-select uh, uh, long list of suppliers and they pre-select products, often before anyone in your company even talks to them. And, and uh, this now, as the, the buying process moves completely online, this of course is accelerated even further. So we really need to find ways to talk to the customers earlier in the process. But to do that, of course, we need to know who they are. And, and one way to do that, and, and there are different names for this, but, but one name is, is drip marketing. And it's really, the key is really to understand what is the buying process of the customer. So it's not your internal process. How do you work in your process? But it, it's the, the process for the customer in terms of um, understanding his needs, underst understanding what are the candidate suppliers, how do I apply these products in my organization, etc. To understand that process and how you can help drive the customers through that decision process. Um, and and the, the key is to, to, for each step in the decision process, create what's called a drip or, or, or a trigger, if you will that helps the customer along the way and that pushes him towards actually buying your product. And, and like, like it's is illustrated in this example, you, you, the starting point in this, this example is a white paper. If the customer opens that white paper, he gets an, an e-book. Uh, if he opens that, he is fed into the CRM system where you can complement with, with um, uh, for example, credit history data, you, you can add social uh, media activities, you can add the contextual information about the customer that makes it easier for your uh, sales reps to, to have a relevant conversation uh, with the customer. And then in, in this case, you have uh, an in, inside sales rep that, that calls the customers and, and qualified the leads. And only then, after it's qualified, after you have all this contextual data, uh, it is fed to your 
uh, high powered and hi high knowledge and, and of course expensive uh, uh, field sales organization that, that calls up the, con the, the customer and can have a prepared relevant meeting with a qualified lead. And, and um, uh, th there are softwares to, to of course support this um, uh, but, but the, really the key is to understand what, what is the decision process of the customer and how can I create the triggers or the drips to uh, push and pull the customer along that decision process and then feed the customers or, or the leads into my CRM system and my, my regular lead generation channels, my, my, my sales force. So that summarizes the topics of today. So we, uh, uh, th there are really four keys to monetizing software in, in a B2B world. The first is what you sell, and, and, and this is the, the office structure, and in particular, the, the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the landing products, and then the upsell pass that you define to take customers from a lower end product to a more premium product. And that's the first area. The second area is how you charge, which is often more important than what you charge. Uh, and how you charge, are that, that's two, two parts to that. That's uh, part one, the, the price metric. And secondly, how does your metric scale with usage? And then thirdly, uh, uh, the third area is, is what you charge. What, what are the uh, prices that we place in front of customers? And of course, the, the one, one key there is how do we differentiate our prices across different customer segments that we often see have very different willingness to pay for, for your products. And fourth and finally, how do we sell our offerings? How do we take it to market? And, and especially in, in this digitalized world. And, and there are really two things I, 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 wanna, I want you to take, take with you. And, and that is really how, one, how we present the offering. How do we structure the offering in the actual presentation to the customer? has a significant effect on, on how he buys. And, and secondly, make sure that, that you engage and, and, and that you, you take control of the early buying process of the customers long before they actually proactively reach out to you and involve, involve your, your physical sales force. That was all. In terms of the, the presentation, uh, I'm going to invite my, my colleague Sebastian to see if we have collected any questions. Yes. Do you have any questions, Sebastian? We do, we do have questions. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, so we do have uh, uh, one of the first participants uh, who is wondering, how does the bundling strategy vary with the price level um, of the offering typically? So if you have a, a price level of 200 euros to 200,000 yeah. euros, does the, the bundling uh, strategy differ? That's a really good question. I, I think that bundling strategy, that, that's, a, that's an inherent trade-off in your bundling strategy. And, and the, it's really complexity because you want to always want to reduce complexity versus the, the, uh, your ability to meet the differentiated service and product needs of, of your customers and of course differentiation also of, of the prices you charge them. And, and for, for low ticket products you cannot spend of course as much time explaining to the customer how you uh, bonding structure is, is con constructed. So for low ticket products, it's preferable to have a more simple bonding structure, mm. simply to reduce complexity. Mm. Uh, and on the other hand, for, for, for more high ticket sales, you can allow yourself uh, a slightly more complex structure because it allows, you, you have the sales reps in front of the customers that can explain the offer structure and you also are, are very keen to you know, be able to differentiate both the value you deliver to different customers as well as the price you charge them. 
uh, in order to, to, to uh, uh, monetize the value you bring to different customer segments. All right, good. Um, just to, to let you know, uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them in, in, the, in the chat room that we have on YouTube. Um, another question we have is, uh, you spoke about the price metrics uh, used. Would mm. you recommend changing something as big as the price metrics uh, in, in, uh, in the middle of a crisis? Uh, would, do you think that would create too much noise or is this a good timing to do it? Yeah, <clears throat> um, I, I think that, that depends on your relationship with your customers. And, and um, uh, if there is a reason to change the price metric, if, if, you, if you find a price or, or D defined a, 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 a price model and, and including a price metric that is better aligned with your market and your customers and, and gives you a better ability to, ex to extract the value you're creating for them, you should do that change. Uh, so it, it's really about then how do you migrate your current customers. Uh, for new customers that haven't seen your old metrics, so for them is, that's no problem. But for, for your old customers, of course, uh, for some, there may be an issue if they have a, a financial challenges in, in, on, on their side, then of course you, you may want to be careful. So what we do is that, that we, we build a migration plan for our clients when we, when we make price model changes. And that migration plan is really customer by customer where we, where we segment customers in, 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 in terms of these are the customers where the change is going to be easy, they're going to accept it, they're happy. They, they are maybe even willing to pay more. And then you have, of course, other segments there uh, where we see potential issues and where we want to be more careful. Worst case, not even migrate at all or have a multi-step, multi-year migration path mm -hmm. that we take those customers along to, to uh, minimize the risk. Okay, good. Uh, another question we have is, if you only had to pick one of the four areas to monetize <coughs> software that you spoke about today uh, yeah. in, in these times, which one would you focus on? Th that would be the, so in, in these times of COVID-19, what, what we are, are seeing, you know, I, I mentioned we did a survey to our clients, how is the crisis affecting you? Um, and, and of course, when we, when we speak to our clients and. Uh, what they tell us is we really need to uh, align, firstly secure our go-to-market approach and secondly align it with the changing behaviors of our customers. So if I would recommend to focus on one of the four pillars, that would be the last one, the go-to-market, because that is the one that is really the most directly affected by the ongoing pandemic. Okay. Good. Uh, a final question that we see is uh, how should we communicate externally any changes uh, we would make in these times? Should we be reactive or proactive or what's your recommendation? Th that really depends. And, and um, I, I think most importantly, you, you need to plan for how you communicate. You should not leave it to the sales organization or the individual sales reps to decide how they communicate. So. Take control of that and make a plan for how you communicate to different segments. And of course, you want to you want to turn it around when you make a price model change, and you, when you make an, an offer structure change, you want to turn it around and, and of course highlight what are the benefits to the customers. For example, if you if you make a more flexible model, then that, then that's what you focus on in your in your communication. If you adapt adapt it better to different needs of different segments. And that's what you uh, what what you focus on. Maybe not the, the changes to to the price levels if you're doing price increases. Okay, good. Uh, we also have uh, another question that came up. How does price and quality compete with each other? Altogether, missing feature is usually acceptable, but poor quality on delivered feature is uh, debatable. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming this is about that, that you, know, you, you have some features in your software and you're experiencing quality issues with those features. And I, <clears throat> I think most importantly, well, quality issues 
we, you know, they, just, they should be avoided, but there are always quality issues. No, no software is perfect. No, no user, no customer is ever perfectly satisfied. So I think the question is really, uh, what is our quality relative to our competition or relative to the alternatives that the customer have? And, and those alternatives may, of course, be not only competition, but also they, they may want, they may be able to build something themselves, to really put, put these quality issues in perspective. Because some, sometimes you hear that no, we, we cannot go to this office structure, we cannot go to this monetization model, we cannot change prices this way because we're having quality issues. We need to fix them first. And and that that, that may be the case, but but we. Um, we also tend to overestimate the impact of, of quality issues uh, and they should not prevent us from doing what's right from the commercial perspective. Those are really two separate aspects mm -hmm. and we can still drive the commercial agenda although we have quality challenges in our operation. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, so we will leave, uh, we don't have any further questions at the moment, we'll leave this uh, open for, for uh, a minute or two uh, in addition to, to let you guys uh, uh, ask, if, ask any questions if, if there is anything uh, they would like to ask before we end this session. Very good. Thank you for the questions. Uh, very, very interesting and, and a new experience for me to, to present in, in, in this way. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian, for being the, the, the face for me to look at <laughs> during this yeah, presentation. <laughs> Thank you.